Hi, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and welcome to the first FF Distance Edition of the season, hosted in Newark by Hector Principals Jay Shin and Damon Rich. The FF series is an online reinvention of the League's in-person First Friday receptions, tours, and project reviews. Like First Fridays, these programs provide the opportunity to see recent and current projects, as well as to get a sense of where and how firms are working. This season, we are alternating FF online programs with in-person First Fridays. So next month, for instance, SOM is opening up their new studios to League members. Hector's presentation will include their development plan for the Newark Passaic waterfront and their community-based design process for Philadelphia's Mifflin Square. Taken as a whole, the firm's work provides an engaged on the ground example of the overarching theme for this year's combined FF and First Friday series, which features practices navigating the legacies and possibilities of American infrastructure from ecological systems and transit hubs to community facilities and social networks. Today's program will be introduced and moderated by Liza Fior. Liza is a founding partner of the award-winning firm Muff Architecture Art, a London-based practice established in 1995, whose projects, as described on their website, range from urban design schemes to small-scale temporary interventions via landscape and buildings, a continual dialogue between details and strategy. The firm is interested in the design of public spaces and in making spaces public. Following the presentation and Liza's conversation with Jay and Damon, the discussion will be open to all attendees. You can pose your questions in the Q&A section, but please use that section, not the chat section. Before we begin, a quick thanks to the League sponsors. This program is supported in part by the New York State Council in the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, as well as by the League's members, whose annual support makes all of our programs and events possible. Please visit archleague.org for further information about membership and the League's upcoming events as well as past programs. And finally, towards the end of the program, information will be posted in the chat section for those seeking CEUs for attending. Thank you. Anyway, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Anne, for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity of um, chairing today. And so um, here I am in London, in Mare Street, Hackney. And it, it pains me that uh, a practice for whom we do feel aligned um, should be so far away and that we don't get to see Hector Weekly to um, share the pains and pleasures of uh, attempting to make accurate work in the city with those that live there. Um, and I think what we do have in common is that the process is the project as well as the project being the project. But on the other hand, the fact that what we have in common is the very specifics and being site specific and situation specific means that Hector's work is completely um, foreign and exciting and um, and so it is that very difference that I look forward to learning more today from Jay Shin and Damon Rich and we've had the pleasure of um, having moments together whether it was retracing the processional route in Newark where the procession which celebrated the opening of the river park also was an enactment of the multiplicity of voices that made that same park, or the affirmation in Whitechapel of finding um, Mr. Rich measuring the cut curbs um, in one of the projects that we'd built, and then refining and developing that so much further um, back in the States, um, a session in Barking, where student, Barking Town Square, where students who thought they knew where they were, were um, led to see the power structures that might have first been invisible to them. And lastly, the very pleasurable um, thought experiment we enacted together, where we imagined the city of Newark as a children's museum and ask the question, could the city play that role? And um, if we can get it, we'll get a link up in the chat to um, our answer. The answer was no. So I'd like to just now just hand over um, to Damon and to Jay Shin to um, present their work 
As far as the audience is concerned today, um, although we're not going to interrupt them with questions, if people have comments, those random thoughts that flip by, float by like a cloud, those what ifs, if you put them into the chat, we can then pick them up as well as more formal questions at the end. So put the questions in the Q&A area and just put those random floating cloud-like thoughts into the chat. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Anne, and thanks, Liza. Um, and thank you, Architecture League, for having us. Um, um, Rosalie and Rafi Liebman, um, all everyone from the Architecture League who sort of thought of our work and encouraged us to make, uh, you know, an afternoon here to uh, share um, ins and outs of what we've been up to at Hector. So welcome to the Hector office here at 60 Union Street in Newark, New Jersey. All right, so Hector, what is that all about? Uh, it's a bunch of things. We're not going to share them all now, but one of them goes back to a lesson that we were taught by a sixth grader as their class tried to create a collective model, which was when in a scuffle, remind people that you can't have your own private built environment. So that's what we'll take as our title uh, with the subtitle Design for Organizing. So here, mainly on that lesson, we're really focused on hectoring as a normal part of living in an environment. Having different opinions, disagreements, and the requirement to work things out because you can't have your own private built environment. So on the theme of infrastructure anchored in organized communities, we are excited to share with you two adventures that we have been on are currently on that link together places, objects, movements, and people. We started working together, um, doing some exhibitions, really bringing stories about um, the world and reality into gallery space. And this is an exhibition that we did about the 2008 uh, mortgage crisis. Another one out in San Francisco, um, really linking together the relationships and characters that Damon was talking about in the system of um, uh, pulls and pushes and pulls of power. Uh, some detail shots from the exhibition here. Um, here's an exhibition shot from a, a recent exhibition from MoMA. It's currently up at Cooper Union. Um, we have uh, put this model out back in, in the world for an exhibition that is just two months long. So if you're in New York City and have a little bit of time, please do stop by um, the main foundation building exhibition hall. Here's another exhibition. Um, uh, here's a model of the entire city of Newark that we have built, um, currently uh, uh, viewable at uh, Newark City Hall if you are um, somehow finding yourself in downtown Newark. And we're still really interested in spaces that tell their, their own stories of how they got to be the way that they are. Um, in using our tools as designers to work on neighborhoods, including how people get around, cultural centers, landscapes, and buildings. And, uh, more and more trying to find ways that our skills as designers can help support broader movements for land back, like uh, this project with the Globeville Illyria Swansea Coalition on the north side of Denver. So Damon mentioned that the, the theme of today's talk would be infrastructure anchored in organized communities and how we will do it. Um, we took an advice, always good advice from Liza Fior, um, you know, instead of going through our usual slogans and proselytizing that we do so much as designers, actually take the luxury of going through the details of what 
um, what we have designed. And so um, it will feel much like you're visiting us here in Newark um, in our studio, pulling out old files and old drawings. We had a lot of fun um, visiting our older files. So I hope that that format actually is a relaxing way for you to have a little bit of a lunch break. And I just got to add one more muffin counter to Liza's list. When you visited Liza, uh, the Newark planning office, when I worked for the city of Newark, and we were re rearranging our office after pulling down all the partitions, and you took the time to teach a really important lesson about how we could partially cloak the door to the bathroom, which goes directly into where you do your business, with a wall of file cabinets. So I feel like this fun occasion over a Friday, October lunch to pull out some of those files, both for projects that we've lived with now for about a decade and something that's in the studio now trying to get built is really on the dot. So here comes more story about design and less product proselytizing, I hope. Uh, first project is at in where our firm is located in Newark and at, in its riverfront. Like both of the projects we're going to talk to you about today, Hector was one player in a much broader assembly of professionals, advocates, officials, engineers, uh, and especially on these riverfront projects, uh, working with Weintraub Diaz landscape architecture and Monday through Friday graphic designers in one big love puddle of, of collaboration. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Newark. It's very close to New York City. It's edging a river called Passaic River. And here's an aerial view of the edge. And you can see some of the projects in progress that we're gonna describe in more detail now. So we begin with one element of this riverfront landscape, which is a memorial to Sister Carol Johnston, who was a Newark native, who was a sister of charity, and for the last decades of her life, one of the fiercest advocates for environmental justice, especially as regards the Passaic River. The memorial is composed of two very simple objects. Boulder. Boulder and a tree. A weeping European birch tree. And you can really see that this tree edges and looks over to the river. And the tree and the stone define a space where we all try to remember and summon Carol's spirit. With some of her writing on this water jet cut stainless steel panel. And it's a place of celebration. A lot of people like to um, sit here, remember her legacy. Talk to Carol. Talk to Carol. And you can see it, see it all over the social media. And Carol really was, with other people that we were lucky to work with on this project, a living link to a long and strong legacy of struggling for environmental justice in Newark and in specifically in the Ironbound neighborhood. So against incinerators. Against smokestacks that, making, that made New Yorkers sick against garbage dumping at the ironbound um, part of the neighborhood, against the toxic waste. And you can see some of the signals on the riverfront today of this legacy, some of which are required by law, like trilingual signs about not eating the seafood. And some of these signs are done in a way that um, you know, took us a little bit more time to do the research and do the production. And so these really try to spring out of the basic infrastructure of a park, like a railing uh, or, um, or a log uh, to tell some of these stories. So for example, the infamous site of Diamond Shamrock where the chemical, uh, the chemical weapon, Agent Orange was produced that the United States used in the war uh, in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. It explains some of the landmarks that you might see if you're going around uh, Jersey on the path train or on a boat, like this cap site of that factory that has a 10 foot thick layer of concrete on top of it. And as you go down 
this railing along the river's edge, you not only learn about real things that happen, like people looking out of their window and seeing men dressed in spacesuits vacuuming the sidewalks, you also learn about the ongoing struggle to hold the polluters to account. And some of the creatures are captured on the railing um, who say, do not catch or eat me, I'm poisonous. And it's a place that you can touch um, <clears throat> and uh, be at the river's edge. And so as part of this legacy, a small contribution to continuing it and spreading the word further, we designed a riverfront guide. And unlike a lot of the historical representations of Newark and its Passaic Riverfront that always look to the east, so you always can fit that New York City there at the top. Um, and this is uh, typically how Newark was sort of portrayed in historical images. You can see Manhattan in the back. We really wanted to flip that and actually put um, the entirety of Newark in this map that we made. And to think about the actual architecture that you find around the city and how it might be conceived of in a river-centric worldview. From the factories that are in the largest port on the East Coast that few people see unless you work there or visiting someone in the correctional facility, to the South Ward, which sometimes feels like a world away from the river, but also um, is only about three or four miles. And it's all about the characters and the um, groups of people who convened the coalition of the Friends of Riverfront Park that we wanted to also celebrate in this poster. And so to that end, uh, it uh, includes information here on the left about various proposals for public access and public land. And on the right, the at times zany assemblage of the environmental politics of this place, from that capped diamond shamrock site to the largest sewage treatment plant uh, in New Jersey, to the entire watershed and all the different creatures, including ourselves, who live there, to the bottom of the river where the dioxin lurks. And here it is, um, our, the friends of River from Park, along with our current mayor, Mayor Ross Baraka. And they're really the ones who sort of um, programs and organizes all the events and happenings um, at the Riverfront Park, like this one, the performance at the Riverfront Praises by the Passaic and um, Latin Jazz Festival. And they also are the ones who are, who have become sort of um, experts in the political workings of the development along the Riverfront. Because of course, all these things had to happen before anyone would have a chance to actually design and build something, right? The relationships of property, of regulation. And it was this group of friends of the riverfront that really held that to task and carved out the space for there to be a public space on the riverfront. So they were the ones involved in long-term debates about the development of the city and the rules for that. Um, they're the ones who are meeting every single month to deal with maintenance issues or to plan programs and activities that'll happen. And they put together um, co uh, a petition to make sure that this project is um, built and maintained, um, really organizing the forces around the city, uh, starting from the young set of young people like teenagers that you see and then, then Mayor Cory Booker. And this really provided the tradition for the beginning of a design process, which in this case was an existing uh, condition survey, uh, as Jay mentioned, done collaboratively with uh, a whole group of teenagers who had grown up along the river and brought with them all kinds of stories and rumors and speculations. And really imagining what the uh, riverfront should be like, um, perhaps in the in the far future of uh, 3000. And we, um, similarly to those kinds of activities, we've done uh, boat tours along the riverfront, um, learning the history and just being out there on the river. And for us as designers, this tradition of organizing, this set of activities is what it made possible to conceive of the design work that we were about to do, to think of this contribution to this landscape as one new family member in a whole strange cast of characters from the Penn Station to the new soccer 
uh, arena um, and to somehow think about the relationship that we hope that this built thing would have to its surroundings. So to that end, we have organized this presentation um, by those objects uh, that are that exists in the field in relationship to one another, and you can see the aerial view of the same um, same area. So the first element is the street. Yeah. So to get to the riverfront at all, one has to begin in a historic park, hundred year old park called Riverbank, and then cross a local but very dangerous street where a couple of people die every year called Raymond Boulevard. So the first thing we had to do was to put a safe um, street uh, crossing uh, with the, the, the light. Um, but, you know, we also realized that this plan to actually have the riverfront park edging an existing um, existing river bank park was in the plans since um, since the 20s. And back then, this crosswalk was imagined as, a, uh, as some sort of tunnel uh, come, going out to the river's edge. Yeah. And so this part never got built, uh, to be clear, but the, but the part on the south side of the, of the street did. So as you can see, here's the entrance without the crosswalk. And then after we were able to install the crosswalk. So we had to find another $200,000 in our budget just for this equipment. Talk about infrastructure. And talking about infrastructure, the part that we part of the part that we are discussing is really a, a just a smaller portion of a larger system of the park along the riverfront, and uh, some of which have been built um, uh, is, is continuing to be built uh, to to this date. And so this is the second segment that was built uh, that we were uh, the most involved with the design. Um, and so here you can see it's a fairly narrow site, uh, has some wildness in section. And the attractions here were about these moments along this kind of fairly narrow way. Um, so as you come in, what we just were looking at is this crosswalk on the plan. And then it takes you to an entry, a little cleared space. And here it is as the hat on that historic park. So the entry is, um, the edge of the entry is a railing, a set of railings that sort of embodies the characters of, uh, from, from the history of this place, um, like the donkey that you see from the canal that um, will show you the historical photo, but it required a lot of sort of making friends with these characters that we have learned from learn, uh, the street. But of course, in the designing of it, really thinking about the relationship to our bodies. And so these are all characters that inhabited this site at some point in time, and this railing kind of serves as this initial curtain call, like the beginning of a play where it lists all the characters. So for example, transversing this site from the late 1800s till the end of the 1920s was the famous Morris Canal that went up more altitude and down than any canal in history up until that point. And to move the boats along were these donkeys. And the canal was in the end covered over at the river's edge, but we, um, Love seeing this donkey and his friends in the production shop. And so what if these spirits inhabited the wood and adjusted its shape? Um, and some of the friends didn't really quite make, make the cast, but um, if you were to visit our office like you are doing today, you can meet um, some of those other characters here. So we made a final composition that you know, really involved like the most recognizable characters, the ones that played the most significant or curious roles. Uh, these were just cut out of laminated timber. And here it is uh, finished and assembled in the shop. So you see trees, a gas holder, factory, and canal boat donkey, Lenape people, some of the fish and birds that live there. 
and installed, um, of course, without initial troubles. Some initial troubles. Some initial troubles. <laughs> and you know, the, the I think design ideas for this came from many different places. A kind of perverted version of the national park system from railings that again sprout up into functional elements like wayfinding maps. And a large sign that showed the entirety of the city so that people can see the river's relationship to the rest of the city. And this sign had, um, uh, this sign included key buildings, the recognizable buildings from all over the city uh, uh, engraved onto the surface. And the engraving uh, was routed out uh, to uh, three different depths and paint was applied uh, differently to create both a hierarchy as well as a kind of miniature landscape routed into the wood itself. Went through a lot of testing, testing of the material, um, just making sure that the materiality of the wood remained very vivid. And this really was one small gesture towards saying that even though this riverfront is in some people's neighborhood, it has to be a place for the whole city and even the region beyond the city's boundary. Uh, these are the four languages most spoken in Newark, Spanish, Portuguese, English, and Haitian Creole. Other, other wayfinding signs getting produced, routed out, painted, trying to give names to these different things. Um, like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll meet you at the Overlook. And so as you walk in along with the, the railing and signage, you'll also see um, on the ground uh, engraved uh, granite markers um, that has the poem of Langston Hughes, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. Um, and it allows you to shift your views um, from looking at the river, then onto the ground. And it also includes all of the sources of funding for the project, both the private individuals who uh, required their uh, acknowledgement, but also all of the public sources, like the New Jersey Hazardous Discharge Site Remediation Fund, HDSRF, for those of us in the bits. Here's an image of the entrance on one of the more uh, well, Ju July 4th parties um, that we've had. It's a good place, like Damon was saying, you know, the, the parts of the parks are to gain names. And so if, you, if, um, if one of the organizers of the event said, let's meet at the entrance, that's where you go at the entry of the park. And this is also where Lenny, one of the Friends members, um, sets up his welcome table at all the Friends events. Lenny Thomas was there when they beat back the minor league baseball stadium to save River, Riverbank Park. So, that, so now as you advance towards the Passaic, you reach the hill. And the grade has always been pretty extreme in this area. Um, there are still living people who remember this, which they refer to as the Buck Naked Beach. And this is um, what the hill looks like as constructed. And, you, you know, even back then, during the Olmsted era, you know, they did think about this continuing um, grade that started from the edge of uh, River Bank Park leading into the, the Pacific River's edge. And you can see how they managed some of the grade uh, again, going underneath the road at, at the time uh, was the proposal. And it got voided. Um, yeah. Here's some existing conditions photos. Yeah, so this was the condition of this part of the riverfront uh, when we first began this work. And here's our grading plan. So you can see that there's these kind of lumps that roll across the site and the pathways cut across the grade to be accessible and, and comfortable and begin to define the different zones. Now, changing the shape of the landscape was not simple or cheap. Uh, one previous occupant of this parcel of land was the Balbach Smelting Company, which you can see here, you actually can see the Morris Canal uh, going behind this spit. And they did all kinds of things to take precious metals out of rocks. 
And here's, a, we were required to actually do some archeology span um, and the soil was full of toxic stuff. And, and of course we had estimated that and we knew it was gonna be expensive and our financial managers at the Trust for Public Land um, were really focused on that. But it turned out that disposing of this contaminated soil was even more expensive than we had predicted. So we were forced to really think about um, make this hill a lot steeper than we had originally um, shown in the grading plan. And the problem was that a lot of um, parents who saw the steepness of the uh, grade um, was really concerned because they were just well, concerned about the safety of kids. Because what happens with the kids up the hill? They, they roll. And so we couldn't convince necessarily the financial managers of this importance. And so that's why the friends of Riverfront Park and especially the moms showed up um, to argue this point and to get a little bit more money that resulted in a slightly less steep hill. And the way that that was accomplished was introducing some elements that were not part of the original design. So you see this bench that cuts across the landscape. Um, and here it is in section, the gravity wall, uh, and that allows the grade to drop much more steeply than we had originally considered while keeping the landscape portion not scary uh, for, par for parents. So here, here you see the edge of the hill, the sitting wall going in. Uh, in construction, and you can see that um, they really come in and out, like leaving and um, sh showing and hiding themselves in the in 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 the space. Kind of creates like a little secret path uh, that that of course like younger people love to love to walk down, um, and so you can see the series of kind of thresholds defines uh, the space as you approach. The riverfront and we still couldn't afford to dispose of all the soil we needed and that resulted in some playful lumps uh, over by uh, the the roadway and all of this is celebrated and elevated and held up uh, by a log sign uh, about the ball box smelting works both how it worked technologically but also about the politics of the environmental cleanup and how that is funded and here's how we research where exactly those uh, smel uh, smelting companies uh, uh, elements were so we had to find out what you know what acid room was and we you know uh, make sure that it's written in our signage that um, you know all the accidents that had happened covered with hot metal was illustrated and captured in our in our log signs there's like labor unrest organizing, there's employees that steal precious metals, there's explosions. Here's the signage at the, um, at the shop. And you know, the hills also really allow us to manage the circulation along the site. Lee Weintraub insisted on steel edging for the asphalt pathways. We we're happy that we did that. And all along the, um, the paths, we have these uh, signs that, uh, educational signs that you have seen um, so far. So here's one about uh, Lenape people at the river. And these log signs come from places like uh, Archigram's log plug, but also just national parks standards, like turning boulders into fountains. And so here you can see how the log is held up by a steel armature and uh, the ground. with a footing in the ground. And uh, you know, these talk about the use of people, the use by people of technology in place. So whether that's Lenape fishing technologies and, and preservation, which was uh, described and reviewed by the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Indians of New Jersey, or the technology of the Morris Canal that moved those boats up and down the hills. And of course, the his, uh, history of uh, Spark, the folks who saved the River Bank Park from being sold into and um, be becoming a site of local baseball team. This one was like the hardest because we were trying to draw people who were still alive. And so getting their clothes or their hairstyle right uh, became a pretty important thing.
and so accumulation of characters and people and really um, the group uh, the spark now friends of the riverfront park uh, you, you know to the maintenance work cleaning up making sure that these signs are fresh and clean and the, along these paths you can really sit and rest and also these hills become a place for um, audience for the performance at the at, at the river the river's edge a place to watch movies with the city as a backdrop, a place to gather to watch performances, a place to declare your beliefs to the world. So we should go through the edge pretty fast. Um, uh, we have a boat dock that we had installed and that's how <clears throat> there's yet another way of approaching the park from the river itself. And the edge is not a static thing that's like once and for all. In fact, to install this boat dock, which was funded by a special tax on boat licenses, uh, we had to write to a whole series of agencies that regulate the definition of the edge, uh, mostly in the interest of infrastructure. Um, so this is a memo inquiring about a one-time grant or other riparian instrument uh, that would allow the installation of a boat dock. And this is what was sent in response, where you can see these color codes that correspond to land leases or grants that go back to the 19th century um, that determine the relative property ownerships of the state, uh, the federal, and the city governments. Should we talk about the yeah, so another piece of the, of the edge uh, has to do with the Army Corps of Engineers trying to address the issue that the upper part of the Passaic River up in the suburbs uh, at some distance from Newark persistently flood. And their idea was to build a giant flood relief pipe that would go from those suburbs underneath Newark to release in Newark Bay. And here's the construction site of Army Corps' work. And this was demanded by local officials saying, you can't just build a pipe underneath Newark. You need to build something that increases value. And in the terms of this deal, that value was the stabilization of the developable real estate along the river's edge. And this was accompanied then with the whole vision laid out uh, in the early 2000s by the Army Corps of Engineers. Of creating public um, access along the river, um, of course, uh, you know the the bank, the the infrastructure of containing the river got did get built, but this public space that you see on the right hand side was of course phase two. So, and in fact, the infrastructure in places failed. Um, fatally failed uh, before that could be accomplished. So what we had was this precarious edge at the riverfront and no public space next to it. And sometimes this uh, failure also happened. And so this is what we mean by infrastructure that is not anchored in organized communities. Um, this, this was actually a vision um, uh, output it by the Friends of the Riverfront as well as um, ICC, Ironbound Community Corporation, and that we really took um, their vision to heart that there has to be public space that is well sustained at the river's edge. It just can't be only you know, infrastructure that contains the edge, but it has to be an infrastructure that contains people. And so the edge is defined by a continuous wooden bench uh, that is covered in a recycled PVC plank. Here are some amazing detailed work at the construction site, um, at, the, at the edge details. And along this edge, the design tries to establish these places to hang out. Um, little nooks and, and crannies, not a regular straight line of an edge. It just becomes a really good, nice um, place for a uh, hangout in different numbers. There's the distribution of the seating places along the edge. And so you can see that we have, we have placed different types of seating furniture. 
into these um, very characterized spaces that are sometimes round and sometimes pointy. And this becomes a place to take in the city in a different way. Um, a place to gather up with friends in one of these indentations. A place to go after your um, uh, Catholic services and take family pictures. A place for dance parties oftentimes, um, comfortable spot to sit around and be contemplative. And so finally, when you reach the water's edge along the orange boardwalk, there's a series of engraved railings that tell these stories, like the dioxin disaster that we mentioned before. And we were able to work with Monday through Friday and an illustrator named Marion Bizet to define an illustrative style that could communicate these really wide ranging stories. So for example, one of the things that had to get done infrastructurally before a park could be put in was a netting chamber for the combined sewer overflow that looked like this once they were done. And the hope was rather than this just being a strange thing that you notice or not in the landscape, to actually have it be celebrated and called out and given its story. And so for example, the story of sewers in the city from no sewers to the first sewers, to sewage treatment plants, to what happens today when the sewer overflows and it rains, to the explanation for the netting chamber that's being installed. You can see the wildlife and maybe identify what it is, understand some of the older infrastructure like the swinging Jackson Street Bridge, and understand the history of development and use of the land, like this landscape of Harrison, New Jersey across the river. And people make rubbings here, um, so it becomes a destination for field trips. And some people express themselves on the uh, railing themselves. Rich game. Um, I didn't do that. Yeah. A romantic evenings, um, girls night out. So I just wanted to wrap up this project by saying, you know, this place with all the characters and spirits become a place that is recognizable for the rest of the city. And this story isn't a simple sort of um, before and after shot, which is what we see a lot in, um, in a lot of those design presentations that we give, that there is so much more before the before and after the after and everything in between. All right, got to put a shout out to the orange sticks. They're maybe the most successful element in terms of becoming an identifiable character in, in this place that takes its own identity in the larger landscape and is subject to all kinds of productive speculation about what it is, who put it there, and what it means. Okay. Well, thanks for wrapping that up, um, Speedy. Um, we want to talk about the second uh, project located in Philadelphia called Mifflin Square Park. And like the other project, it's a collaboration between uh, many partners and many characters, including the Mifflin Coalition and CMAC, a uh, nonprofit that convened the coalition. We start with the entry which is recently built at the corner of uh, Rittner and South 6th Street in South Philadelphia. And it was an opportunistic um, way of building because the local, the Philadelphia Water Department had a plan to build um, a green infrastructure structure underneath and, the existing park. And their idea, and they came in considering this just to be kind of like the settled truth of it, was that they were gonna dig these trenches that could hold water and delay its travel to the sewage treatment plant. And then they just were gonna replace what had been on top of it exactly as it was before. And this is what it was before. At six at Rittner. And people recognize that it's a, it's a currently a social space where people see and be seen, but not necessarily with a great place to sit. And so because this was maybe three years into 
uh, working uh, with these groups about this part. Uh, people were ready to recognize that they could use their design, the community's design, to advocate for the water department to put back something different than what they dug up to put in the green infrastructure. And so we workshop those ideas of what can be built uh, on, on top of the current uh, entrance and, you know, seating benches. was benches and, you know, one of the young thought if it's the green uh, infrastructure that holds water, why not just build a pool right could there? Be, just leave it open, like don't even cover it up, like we need a pool anyway. Um, colors were definitely in. And here's a first iteration of our design coming out of multiple uh, workshops that we went through. And so this got a lot of support. Uh, maybe people thought that it looked like a map of imagined communities or like amoebas under the microscope, uh, but then we had to figure out how to build it. And it turned out that the water department was willing to lower their slab the three and a half inches that it took to, to accommodate some decorative brick, but they weren't willing to uh, supply the brick itself. And so we were pretty concerned because you can't just order a, sm a small supply of specialized custom colored bricks. So we drove out to hand over um, Pennsylvania um, and really saw a whole yard of leftover bricks that we could find and purchase. And we had to adjust the design based on the bricks that were available, matching exactly what it looked like, figure out how they would be laid out in the space. And so they dug it down and uh, they were willing to lay out the bricks. And so this was a whole uh, chain of residents, because uh, we're here in Newark, so residents would be out there uh, with their drawings, making friends uh, with the people working on the site um, in order to encourage and support uh, the amazing generosity of them being willing to not just put some decorative brick here that um, community organization supplied, but also to do it according to this pattern. We also had a chance to build this walking path um, along the rain garden that was put on the other side of Sixth and Rittner. And the idea was that, you know, against I think the initial idea of the water department that this would kind of be like an isolated zone that would almost be bitten off from the park to achieve this other infrastructural function of managing water. Introducing this sidewalk, this footpath, um, which was like the first thing that anyone wanted to do when they saw the plan, made it yet another landscape in this place. Ceremonial photos from last visit. And some of the things that we found um, helpful was these drawings that figured out exactly where to put some of the seating stones. And as they're installed here, you know, the texture of the, uh, the sitting stone next to the bricks that we found is pretty awesome. It also reflects some of the um, uh, context, architectural characteristics of the context. Here is the Buddhist temple right across from it. And people sort of occupy the space in all kinds of ways. So as you come in, uh, there's also these engraved granite markers. Um, a first one that explains the specific function of this space and how it was created. And the second one to recognize the residents and local organizations contributions to its construction. In in including um, community spelled out in all kinds of languages, in, uh, Burmese, Chinese, and Spanish, and Hebrew. Yeah. And Yiddish <laughs> and engraved in uh, inlaid with gold. Um, and then uh, this was an initial sketch for a larger graphic that was also engraved into the granite that shows the park, shows where the rainwater, stormwater, and sewage from the park and surrounding areas goes to the specific sewage treatment plant. And so also on here, you can do rubbings. Um, the water department already does a lot of education uh, because they've been so active in doing projects like this. And so this adds another way for the environment to tell its own story. And this is the first piece to take material form 
of a much larger design for the reconstruction of the entire park. Um, and here, here's a broader view of that vision of that reconstruction. And we'll walk through some of the components of it, but really wanted to set up the context for 2016 when we um, uh, started to work on this project was when the Trump era started along with the Muslim ban. So this area of the Philadelphia being very densely populated with people from all kinds of places um, meant for us, um, you know, a really meaningful project to be engaged in. So in this part of Philly, people live in row houses, the main shopping street, uh, which is 99% immigrant owned, really there's one place, so Silverman's Pharmacy, that's not owned by an immigrant. And, you know, a lot of people come from um, uh, places in Asia. They are um, uh, refugees, sometimes uh, from South Asia, and really from places all over the world. This is a map that we created to um, show their initial locations of home. But this park that is really well used, um, uh, as you can see, it's a hot summer day with a spray. Although its intense use is also connected to some limitations or spatial conflicts that people identify in the, in the park. So there's not many places to sit. So people sit along the curb, both at the entrance and in here in the center. And some people bring their own chairs to sit. Yeah, but the problem is when there's a um, uh, you know, when there's a football level players right next to it, you know, there it starts to have some sort of conflict and dusting, dust blowing the air. You know, the football level is really popular in uh, with the residents around the park. And so they sort of took it to their own hands to build uh, the, the courts. But when it rains, it gets all muddy. There's performances a lot, but people have to perform in the sidewalk. And you can see there's not much of a place for any kind of, of official seeming audience. And the playground uh, needs a lot of help. Some of the equipments are really aged. The main thing people said that they do on the playground is bully other people. <laughs> and so sometimes uh, young people really find other ways to climb up and play. And exercise, um, you know, they, they, people figure out a way to um, use benches for exercise. And one of the biggest issues in the park is that everyone said that they felt on top of each other, even though the park is about four acres. And so there was a real disjunction between these two observations. And one of the things that was clear that people identified was how many paths and curves have been introduced into the park over the years that served to kind of divide these spaces into into pizza slices, oftentimes with not really well used corners. So one of the ways that we really learned a lot about this site and how it might work in the future was through uh, a civic investigation project uh, working with the Philly Mural Arts Organization called Park Powers. A set of young people um, employed by city's uh, youth employment program really set out to ask question, what does Southeast Philadelphia have to do to get Mifflin Square Park rebuilt how it wants? And so people did surveys, physical surveys, tried to understand how different parts were used, went to the Philly Library and understood the development of the neighborhood in relationship to the park, understood the park over a couple uh, over the sweep of the decades, and then did interviews. So interviewed, for example, community leaders uh, in the neighborhood, uh, the head of capital projects for Philly Parks and Recreation, to try to understand all of the social dynamics uh, around this place. They made uh, drawings that tried to uh, break down some of the unspoken dynamics of power, of uh, the way people were hierarchized by, by uh, how they were racialized or how they were gendered. Uh, they also went to the library to find ways um, to really talk back to claims that people would say like, oh, the park was really nice until all these uh, Kamai people came here and didn't know how to use a garbage can. And they actually found that in the 20s, people were struggling in South Philly for clean streets. 40s and 60s, they were struggling against violence. 
And so really um, learning about these stories with the elected officials through interviews, young people, um, start to understand the structure of governance and where the money comes from and how they flow into the infrastructure and building and maintenance of the infrastructure. And they also mapped out all the local organizations and created this character um, that sort of engulfed all the organizations into, into one. And then they worked with the nonprofit um, leaders to really help them um, validate and uh, verify their research. And these became ways to start conversations about, well, how does a park get rebuilt? And if a community has specific ideas, how can they best advance them? Um, we did all kinds of drawings that summer of all the kinds of people that you meet uh, in South Philly and in the park. The buildings that you see, the things that you see on the ground, like broken beer bottles once in a while. And students made this whole series of large scale drawings inspired by the music of Meek Mill who's from South Philly, um, like this one called Park Dreams and Nightmares. And started to introduce these characters that they saw at the park, um, you know, really bringing uh, their life's experience of serving the park, both the users and people who maintain and govern the, uh, the uh, city government into their drawings and into the conversation. And so this is a drawing that was made by the whole group to kind of represent the existing conditions at the park and some of the aspirations that are in the air as well. Um, some of these drawings we turned into uh, posters where young people can draw their um, ideas for future park. And so all of this became utterly critical knowledge for making the plan for reconstructing the park. And the first insight that really came out of it was the necessity to repack the suitcase. Because you know, when you go on a trip and you're kind of in a hurry and you pack really fast, you might not make the most efficient use of space. And so that seemed to be one of the things going on here in the park. Whereas historically the park um, wasn't broken into smaller pieces, um, as time went by, you know, users and park department start to put different programs and that's why um, the different fragmented pieces of the park came to be today. And so if you took all the different programs as the park existed in 2018 and laid them all out, you'd see some of the reasons for this. Again, these are separated by curbs and they become quite odd pieces for using for the things that people want to do. And so repacking the suitcase meant taking apart the functions that people really want to keep in the programs, adding new ones, and finding better ways to um, uh, better ways to, to pack them together. And really taking that conversation to the users so that they are able to negotiate different areas that they occupy and use here are the volleyball players. And all of this went into the dimensioning of the plan in terms of interactions and hopefully lack of interactions. So to give you a rundown of the elements that compose this, first is a sports yard, because it was so important to move the active sports played by adults that sometimes were accompanied by alcohol drinking or a little bit of gambling away from the quieter areas where elders wanted to gather or where little kids played. And so we talked a lot about the way these things could be organized to give those people their space, but to not have the dust that they're kicking up or the giant mud puddles they might create impinge on others. So this is how we consolidated, uh, formalized and consolidated some of those sports yards that exist now, really thinking also about how the um, audience watching the players can be incorporated into the design. And we continue to be in touch with the users and leaders of the sports yards. So second element, which is play for younger people. We talked a lot about the shortcomings of the existing playground and through a lot of interacting with models and objects, talked about some of the important things for a playground. First of all, having separate spaces for different ages to slightly decrease the, the inclination for bullying. 
to create a kind of protected and like hugged space. Which was an important idea for the parents who, you know, really wanted the play area to be a major, well, well uh, protected area within the park. Um, here is a basic layout of the playground for younger people, playground for um, older, as older children, five to 12, and uh, in between, it's connected and separated by the splash. And we really thought about different ways to bring in um, plays, so more, um, uh, less conventional of uh, play structures like these. And this was a whole back and forth, as you might imagine, with the maintenance division of Philly Parks and Recreation in terms of things that were really exciting, but also things that could be taken care of. So a third element we called the cultured landscape, cultured like yogurt. Um, if people could come together around a plan to put the active sports and the play on one half of the land, then the other half could be freed for some of the quieter activities that people were interested in, like a meditation area with a mandala or mounds in the landscape. Uh, a lot of kids said that they are sick of having a flat park. Um, so stones to sit on, um, quiet planted areas. And so this is sort of how we have went back and forth between our understanding of the design process with the residents and um, back at the office making our drawings. And so the second commandment after the first commandment of repack the suitcase was make it South Philly, but with some perks. And we interpreted that to mean these kinds of moments in the landscape, objects, characters, that would psychologically expand the space, like you were ironing out this park from a, uh, a fabricated sculpture in the shape of a really significant mountain uh, for Karin people uh, in Burma, to mounds in the landscape, Finally, it's really important that we think about the way people occupy and gather uh, around, around the space. So we talked about how there is a need for, you know, a, a visible way, a central way to mark those gathering places, sometimes as simple as benches. It was like, how many people do you need to, to play a good card game? That was like a big debate. Exactly. And then we um, tested out some of those ideas with these um, uh, temporary sitting structures became, uh, and, and we also wanted to preserve the way people sat at the edge of the park. And so some of that is realized in that new entry at Six and Rittner. And we also wanted to be aware of cultural, different cultures that sit at different ways. So the, the, the idea that we sit on the platform and not necessarily on, on the benches in a lot of Asian cultures was important as well. And so then there was the question of how does this all come together? The existing center of the park is this large spray shower, although there's not that much seating for parents and it kind of creates an awkward crossroads for the park. And so we thought a lot about how these different sides and different activities and different spirits might swirl together in the central space. People had ideas for kind of vertical elements. One of the biggest agenda items, which is still gonna be a heavy lift, was a building with bathrooms and a meeting area. And this building takes its cornice line from various architectures found around the neighborhood and continues it onto the shape and uh, shape of the fences around the sport, sports yard that you saw earlier. And one of the most important parts, moments of these, uh, these processes of talking with the residents in the design process was not only coming up with designs, but the conversations that we were able to have. Like this uh, gentleman on the left, he said, you know, uh, his family came from the South, from straight from farming to the city. So when they came to the Philly, um, not having a lot of green areas was a really stark experience for them. And that's why the park is really important. And this Karin woman who is a refugee um, from 
Burma mentioned, yeah, you know, that's exactly the experience that I had coming to this country. So these different geometries, these different people, we hope would come together in this central crossroads. And so the scale of the place goes from this, which is the existing condition, to a much closer type of space, while still preserving that important crossroads and the diagonal paths. And of course, just like here, just like the riverfront, what's most important is the people that meet to keep the programs and the maintenance going. And that is also being spread right now with the newspaper as the, as the project tries to raise its final $4 million to go into construction supported by petitions and of course, neighbors. So as we imagine this different landscape, this different physical and social infrastructure for the future, we imagine a place that keeps it South Philly with some perks, repacks the suitcase and makes room for everyone. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I rather than I want to ask my questions last because we make, can make some space for our audience. And it's a pity that the whole audience can't put um, their cameras on because we're sort of talking into this void. But I know there is some audience here. I can see there's 67 people in this room. Um, and so, uh, Great. So I just thought I'd look to, go to the first formal question in the questions. There's just the one. It's from John Cassidy. Cheers from an NJIT alumni and Philadelphia resident who says, thank you for sharing such great work. I'm wondering if you have any words on the, to the wise on patience while working on these public longer term projects or any project that's open to the hectoring of urban life. And I suppose that, that question where um, we're all gonna use this phrase that there's the before to the before and the after the after, the before and after shots. Um, you know, so John, do you, want to, do you want to chime in? Is John allowed to speak? Does John John have to send us a, a text? Because I, th I think it's interesting to say how long you know, I always say, well, we have to just keep taking our vitamins. Just text. Because, because the great thing in a way with very long projects is you have longitudinal research. And the, as the longer, the longer the before of the before, if you do it right, the stronger the trust relationships and the less time you have to hang around in the after of the after because the project's been handed over to others. So yeah. maybe John, maybe John can just give a time frame when he was like, let's have a look. He said something. I don't know that's somebody else's question. Yeah. Well, John, um, <laughs> if he's around, I will I will say another word on patience is when we insert ourselves into existing set of organizing that happened across a decade, like in the case of the riverfront, you know, the decades that came before us, even um, reaching back to the 30s when the riverfront park was first imagined. Um, and the fact that the fact that the resident organ organizations have been fighting for this park to happen and along with all the other economic, social, and environmental justices, that this park, the project of the park is only one piece of this longer struggle. Um, I, I, I think you get to have a little bit of perspective. But of course, I think it's, I, I don't want to undersell the joy and excitement of seeing the bricks being laid at the entry of um, Six and Rittner in Philadelphia, although we know that it'll take a long time to realize all the parts that we did get to talk about in the park. You know, it's amazing to see the first um, portion being built and used. Um, before, we, before we got a couple more, so yes, so John said, he's thinking about three years of his involvement. That's nothing, John, sorry, um, Damon. <laughs> and to Jay. <laughs> well, I guess with Philadelphia, work um, we started in 2016 
and we have you know um renewed thankfully our contracts multiple times since then and it's still an existing and robust pro uh, project in our office today um and we are uh, before we go further um anthony's asking can you tell us something about what you're up to in detroit anthony are you a, a detroit resident concerned that you haven't been invited to come and play what, what are you up to in Detroit, you two? Yeah, and Liza, I, I do see in the chat that participants cannot unmute if they can only Yeah, yeah, but no, that, they're texting. John, John's chatting away. Yeah, he's <laughs> laughing. Yeah, anyway, but I'm moving back to Anthony and his question about yeah. a few words on Detroit. Yeah. Well, I would say that Detroit has been, I think, a challenge for our system of keeping the faith that John asked about. One small confession is that as a young child, I guess, in the, in the information age, I uh, was a part of something that now seems very embarrassing with some of our national headlines over here called the Important Papers Club. And I do feel that some kind of near fetish for the bureaucratic machinery of how places get pushed around or are pulled somewhere, um, has been has been really important for not not you know losing marbles through this process and and I guess that means not thinking of all of our social systems what you know what the GOP would call social engineering in a in a pejorative sense not thinking about all of these papers and maps and regulatory systems as the enemy of what we're building or the landscape or the necessary torture that we go through to get there, but actually the joy of the work. To see, to be a tiny ant and to see these small pieces either falling into place or falling somewhere else. Uh, and to see this, you know, again, in honor of, of Latour who became an ancestor, this vast assembly, right, of objects and people and politics and documents that it takes to do this work. And as far as Detroit goes, um, we were hired by the city government uh, to work uh, with a number of neighborhoods on the far west side under the names of Warrendale and Cody Rouge. Uh, so this is uh, like uh, Joy Road community, Waco, places like that on a neighborhood plan. This is like 30,000 people. And the special twist on it was to make it a youth centric plan. The Skillman Foundation, some others went in for half uh, of the budget, and that was their request. And so the challenge, which is still playing out there, is what are the priorities of a community and a set of young people when it comes to how they get around their neighborhood, the houses in their neighborhood, the parks, et cetera, and what is the city apparatus of bureaucracy willing to heed? So, so um, the, advice to, the advice to the anonymous attendee who says, I, I'll pick you up, Jake, um, have you got some tips for designers who want to get into the field is embrace bureaucracy, embrace limits. So that that's because this is some of the, the material of architecture. Is that is that fair to say? So well, it, embrace it, but like kind of be taking like a close look at it, like as you do, yeah, like okay. studying, right? I mean, this is like a system, you know, that 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 we have to inhabit and make our way in and advance the agendas that we have or, or are representing against the agendas that would not consider it. And speaking of embracing all the details and structures, you can find all, all about the, the process at Detroit at um, Cody Rouge and Warrendale.org. So it's a vast documentation of the process that we've gone through. And I think that we are very close to releasing our final report. Let's we'll type that into the into the questions because it's open. I think so people can see the see the um see the answers that way. Um one thing that you don't say, which is good, I mean there's you clearly are still the designers. I'm going to ask a question because we've answered all the questions in the open questions, apart from Jennifer, who said, thank you for sharing these dynamic projects. Oh, sorry, I don't get a chance to ask my question because Brian's asked a question. The use of text writing research is really notable in your work and it's consistent with the work at CUP, which that refers to, to one of Damon's former lives. Uh, the Centre for Urban Pedagogy. I love how it adds depth 
and layers of depth to all your projects. How do you get other stakeholders excited about the approach of getting involved in research? And perhaps I could add to that, Brian, if that's okay. How do you get paid for that extra work? Because in a sense, this unsolicited, unpaid work, which, um, you know, Muff celebrated, we always did more than we were asked. We're beginning to realize like why, you know, that's why it's precarious, <laughs> that's why nobody respects it, why it doesn't give value. And I think that the more we see of your before the before rather than, than the um, citizens before the before is surely what can happen is the process can become as big mm-hmm. as the capital project or bigger. Um, do you have private income? You know, how does it work, Jay and Damon? How, this getting, and, and, and um, because I think one of the things that we just saw was sometimes there's external organizations, like there's the mural project, mm-hmm. and you come into it and set them a challenge. They already exist, someone else pays them. But do you have situations where nobody's excited and they're just like, could you just be designers and get on with it? Well, before like, by Damon- John. Damon, answers that I do have to say. I've got, no, look, here I am. Not, we don't have like private funding, um, yes. but <laughs> Sorry. We, we, we do have to afford our salaries. Yeah. So, so one <laughs> devious innovation that I think we stole from someone is phase zero. And definitely the, you know, the arguments or, or persuasive approaches towards a phase zero differ on who you're talking about. Um, for like an upsight, uh, uptight city government, it's about like uncovering the landmines before you walk across the field. Um, for a group like uh, CMAC in Philly, it's about building your ranks um, before you start really putting your shoulder into the, into the big effort. And so, you know, in terms of excitement, you know, I think that it is, um, it's like one of those people with the dowaging rods that's looking for water. It's our job to keep on walking around with our stick until someone gets excited. <laughs> um, and, and certainly part of that is appealing to people's interest in their own lives, right? Like understanding where people are coming from, understanding how say Mifflin Square Park was supposedly the neutral ground between like the Italian or Irish gangs and and the black gangs uh, in the 1950s and 60s in in South Philly. And so being able to talk to people about that um, is always exciting and and generally always brings out some kind of stories. And and for a lot of our um, clients who they themselves are community organizers and who they themselves spent their lifetime doing this kind of work before you know, work of bringing coalition together before launching onto your own project um, because they're you know naturally um, aware that this is critical part of getting anything done um, we have found that our way of working uh, sometimes doesn't need a lot of convincing and in fact of our partners actually do want that phase zero to be very well structured and well funded. We also call it the door knocking phase, if, if that is appealing to people. And um, can I just jump in? I mean, <coughs> the, the orange of the River Park is very orange. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's easy to imagine that this is the reclaiming of orange for Newark reclaiming it back from evil Agent Orange into something more jolly and playful. How many people are involved in choosing that shade of orange? Because maybe there's some people who just didn't like orange. I mean, it is, you know, because it's a kind of, I don't know what anyone else thinks in the audience, but that this isn't um, a kind of participative practice mm-hmm. where Jay and and Damon recede. I assume that or or that you hate orange, but somebody chose orange, so you just went ahead with orange. And maybe to sort of you know that this is the architectural league of architects, mm-hmm. and and I wish it was compulsory that all architects in had to all go to each other's architectural league talk so that somebody works on one of those pencil towers designing somebody else some client's 
you know, wardrobe would be coming to your talk and you'd be going to the wardrobe design talk. But yes. um, they, you know, it's just, it's sort of interesting that, that are you actually, you know, when do you recede and when you don't? Mm. Can you describe something you absolutely hate, but you included it because it was part of that discussion? Yeah, well, I'll let Damon answer um, the question about orange. Um, but say, say but I would say- You got a myth in you know, moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think that one thing that I want to add even before that is um, this notion of participatory design, um, the way we see it is not necessarily about, you know, number of options, but really having a conversation um, about things like location of the volleyball court, whether it should be, you know, next to a set of play playground equipment or next to a you know more quieter edge of the park and really having a process oriented conversations um, and really allowing um, discussions about pros and cons of that decision making to take bigger space than this celebrated opportunity to pick the colors, pick the equipment um, and things like that. So, you know, I think we, um, so someone really wise from our team mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's much more productive to be arguing and negotiating about a location of the volleyball court than the definition of equity. Well, things that I hate that got included in projects. <laughs> no, it's always because of a negotiation, right? It's always because yeah. of, you know, this hectoring of urban life, as somebody said. So I can think of, well, like we were talking about, you know, the first time that we were talking about doing the riverfront park in Newark, everyone was like, oh, great, you're going to have a riverfront park that everyone's going to die crossing the road. And so we had to find 200 grand to pay for the stoplight. That also included the first, as far as we know, road diet, you know, where we went from three lanes going one direction to two lanes going one direction. And that was a knockdown, drag out, legendary debate with our streets department. Um, and so sometimes it said, oh, okay, well, we can go down to two lanes, but you're gonna have to give me some more street parking spots. Um, and so there's many, many uses of space that are, I think, unhappy results of negotiations. But I guess what I was taught by people from Sister Carol to Professor Lauren Susskind, who studies negotiation, that there's a, that there's a principled and systematic way to do it um, that involves things like BATNA, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And if you do your studying, you study the bureaucracy as you embrace it, um, you can hopefully get mostly what you want while having to negotiate, negotiate to accept some things that you might not. Um, I think that was a great answer. I mean, in a way, I was being devil's advocate. Um, but this idea, which, which I you know, really sympathize, empathize with, that is a conversation. And this is what, that you don't have five options. And that in the UK, there's a great adopting of this idea of co-design and we see it as a way of avoidance and as a way to avoid sharing power. And that what you're talking about is co-planting, building a brief together, and, and perhaps out of this um, session, but we can find some fora, whether it's via social media, you know, to think what is the opposite of a conversation? Is it a chatbot? You know, when you're having to complain to the electricity company, is it the I think it's a Google survey. Is it? Huh? I think it's a Google survey. When the Google design survey. process starts with a Google survey, mm. it's a really iffy proposition. I mean, I think one thing you're bringing up that's so critical to us, and it's such a threshold in yeah. so many of our projects, is can you move the negotiation into the realm of drawings? And one of the ways negotiation people talk about this is let's get people to talk about their interests and not their positions. Because mm. as soon as it's on a drawing, then things are adjustable, right? It's no longer my way or the highway. It's like, oh, well, how wide is the highway? And what's alongside the highway? And like, <laughs> what kind of lights are there on the highway? And you know, all these different things. And so that is really critical. And, and the only quick thing I'll say about the orange, which is, yeah, that was a time where we weren't taking votes about orange. Um, 
Lee Weintraub, our collaborating landscape architect, really was interested in teak. But teak requires a whole political calculation, and we calculated no. So it no longer had to be wood colored if mm. we were going to do this other thing. And I feel like the whole trick of that was treating meaning as a projective exercise, right? It wasn't about, oh, orange is Asian orange. It also was about orange is like the orange chakra, which is the water chakra for the for the yoga practitioners mm. in the crowd. Um, it was about like the safety surface, you know, along that edge, like a threshold. So it almost was about as many possible things that it could be. Um, and the boardwalk kind of did that. I think the orange sticks really got an A plus in terms of becoming a screen for people's projections. Yeah, and it's complementary to certain shades of green. So, um, and the nice thing is, Damon, is that you've answered the last question. So I think we are going to, sadly, we're just warming up. We're just getting ready. <laughs> this is, um, so that we can see why it was such a, a pleasure um, and to be invited today. Because the last question, possibly the last but one, if somebody else, the 67 people, or uh, those that are still here have a, another question, was Nancy Jackson's question. And Nancy's question was, how much of the aesthetic is collaborative? What does it actually look like, the subjective bit? So Nancy, I hope that this little rift between Jay and Damon talking materiality and, and uh, color, but also perhaps earlier on in the project that sometimes it's expedience, sometimes it's opportunity, sometimes it's association. Um, if there's any more you'd like to add Jay to the subjective bit, of this, that, but I, I think you've answered it. How much the aesthetic is collaborative? Come on with it. Any more? Um, Say, because <laughs> uh, it's unless yeah. somebody gets another question, that's the last question. Yeah, no, I mean the notion that Damon talked about, where you know the negotiation table is become visible you know, through making of the drawing, um, reminds me of. Um, you know, a, a big lesson that I learned reading um, a book by no, uh, by Jane McAlevey, a community organizer, um, the book's titled No Shortcuts. And she talks about the difference between <clears throat> mobilizing and organizing. Um, you know, mobilizing, you know, protests, getting people out there, uh, making the body count, hashtags and in, in Instagram campaigns brings the people out and we can see the number of people excited about the, um, the, 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 the campaign. But deep organizing, according to her, has to do with embedding and working closely with existing interests and organizations like unions um, that make up you know, teachers uh, working in our cities, hospital workers, and uh, domestic workers and really allowing your campaign to be about sort of the structure that will that has existed and lasted um, will last beyond your campaign so i mean i think that reading that book for me was a big lesson in these notion of participatory processes or subjectivity because you know if the drawing both function as these objects of joy for myself as a designer. Like, I love making the drawings that I've shown today, but also can function as a negotiation table where the interests of different groups, whether it's simply you know, volleyball players and grandmas, but sometimes uh, proponents of grow diet versus people who really, really want the cars to funnel in and out of Newark very fast. Um, you know, if if those very opposing ideas can sort of reveal themselves at the negotiation table that is the drawing, um, to me is, is a sort of a better way to think about, um, you know, definition of participatory design. And, and, and perhaps that, that is a beautiful answer and kind of perhaps answers Nancy's question because that the act of, you know, before you pack your suitcase, you've got to lay it all out. And it's that moment of when you see it all before you put it in the suitcase allows you perhaps to discard some things and give some extra space to others. And that um, the subjective bit 
becomes that cause. And I think, you know, it's the conversation, it's the design, it's the built thing. So thank you so much. It's, um, it's, it's uh, 36 minutes past six here. Look, the ambulances are going back and forwards. There we are, blue light. Um, and so that means it's time to end our session. Um, and, and you've all got to get back to work because it's America where you know about work and you don't just stop on a Friday afternoon because it's um, <laughs> lunchtime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Liza. And thanks to all three of you. This has been an absolutely fascinating and terrific program. I remind everyone um, that we will have a recording of the program up within a week or two. So if you have friends who missed it, you could tell them all about it. Um, the next First Friday is in November live at the brand new offices at Seven World Trade Center, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. That's for league members. And then in December, we're gonna be broadcasting a conversation in place from the Pace Gallery with Tarquazi Dyson um, in the setting of her new exhibition of liquid belonging that deals with water structures and inequity. So thank you all for joining us. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you in person next month and online in December. Thank you. And, and maybe you won't tell your friends because we know that architects like to keep stuff to themselves. <laughs> we learned so many top tips today. Thank We're you about very much. sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you so Come much. Come back soon, y'all.